A week before the Premier League's rampaging monsters clash for the first time this season, both flexed their mental muscles this weekend, staging late shows to secure three points and reminding us that whatever happens at Anfield next Sunday, it won't be over until it's over. Hi folks, you know sometimes an hour just isn't enough time. Tonight for instance we've got to cover last gasp Premier League drama, a shocking injury, tears and the now familiar jeers about VAR, Bayern's sacking of Niko Kovac, further upsets on the continent and more. So without any further ado here are some of our talking points. Now, the top two trailed for a long, long time this weekend before Liverpool and City finally emerged triumphant. Now they prepare to face one another. And even if they don't catch the top two, Leicester and Chelsea continue to look a lot better than the rest. Meanwhile, Niko Kovac's former club sealed his fate. But was he ever really the right fit for Bayern? So plenty for you to talk about. As ever, get your comments in on our Facebook page and we'll address them during the course of the show. John Wilkinson is with me here. Let's get straight into some um, results here, shall we, John, and react yeah. to this one. This was the Premier League weekend that's just gone by. Four away wins there. We're going to touch on just about all the major stories here. One or two highlights for you? Um, how about Newcastle turning over West Ham away yeah. from home and scoring three goals? Newcastle scoring goals. Mm. Goodness gracious me. Mm. Talking about goals. Uh, Vardy's goal against oh. Crystal Palace was probably my favourite goal of the weekend in any league. Mm -hmm. Also, Sheffield United. Good mm. Lord. 3-0. We're we'll going to have a look at the table and just see how far up they are. Look at that nil. They've let in just two goals in the last six games. Second best defence in the league, John. Only mm. eight conceded in total. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic stuff. Let's have a look at the league table, all that has left us with. With this separation, yes, to an extent at the top, but also between third and fourth and the rest. And speaking of Leicester City and Chelsea, a man who played for both of them joins us as he does on a Monday night. Uh, the Australian uh, former Premier League legendary goalkeeper, Mark Schwartz. So good to see a smiling face there once again, Mark. Uh, this league table's not turning out quite the way you would have thought. Look at Sheffield United, deservedly in sixth. Yeah, no, listen, they've been great, haven't they? Um, they were one team I thought would go possibly straight back down. Um, but, you know, they defied the odds so far and they deserve to be where they are. They've been doing brilliantly. You know, we have to start at the top, though. We have to start with the amazing late shows. That's what defines Saturday in the Premier League. First, it was Manchester City champions showing blue grit as they overcame what looked like a game going wrong against Southampton. And then yet again, it was Liverpool and it was Sadio Mane. And it was that stunning, stunning bullet head away beyond the uh, post that got them that win when they'd been trailing with just minutes to go against Aston Villa. Right, let's get straight into that one, John. Um, that was a game that just built and built and built to the most incredible climax, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, there was always an intensity when Liverpool play. Of course there is. But um, Villa, I thought they were great. Mm. They were great for about 50 minutes. And then they just started to get tired. And that's what the top, uh, top teams do to you. They mm. really do take your legs away. Man City better than most. But Liverpool, down the, down the flanks, they're just difficult to keep tabs. Did you, I mean, I'm going to ask you this about both games, Mark. I mean, did you watch this one go on and think, they're losing this? Or at least they're not going to win this, Liverpool? Uh, no, you know what? I always thought that Liverpool would possibly get back in the game. When you look at Villa, first game of the season, away at Spurs, played really well for 50, 60 minutes, and then just started to retreat and retreat and retreat. This, this game kind of went along the same path, and you just felt Liverpool have got the quality and the mm. per perseverance to, to really, you know, get back in the game and they showed it. I think probably, John, because they have lost games this year, if I asked the same question of you about City, you might have been tempted to say, yeah, maybe they will throw everything at Southampton and not get the win. Did, did you feel that they were always going to get a win? I did. Man City, yeah, I did. I mm. just felt that they were, there, wasn't, there wasn't panic stations there. Everything just seemed a lot more controlled, mm. a lot more controlled. There wasn't any urgency. There didn't need to be. Uh, and it was a greasy day. They had a ton of shots, loads of shots, not many on target. Um, but the same with Mane. Players like Aguero and Mane, 
they find a way. Mm. They find a way in the end. Yeah, we'll come back to those stats just now. Um, you know, one of the reasons we talked about mentality monsters and then had that what should we call it, uh, Kyle Kong against Sadio Zilla uh, thing up at the top there, Mark, is because of the monstrous mentality that meant they kept going. Now look at these city stats here. 62 crosses, 17 corners, 20 six shots and as John Riley said only four on target they hurled everything at the opposition but then that's what Liverpool did I mean let's let's just move this on to Liverpool and look at these numbers on the right hand side the away side 25 shots 40 crosses 10 corners that's what these two sides mark can do they will just hurl everything at you largely from the wide areas yeah they do and I think that the, the more you drop down deeper in, in, in defenses the opposition the more opportunity they're going to have aren't they um, and they will push numbers forward. They will get num uh, balls in the box. Perseverance is the, is, the, is the name of the game, and they showed it both of them on the weekend. Let's uh, get some feedback away for the first time tonight. Uh, keep it coming in. It's flooding in already. Jerome's been writing in on Facebook. And Man City and Liverpool both losing in half time, but turned it around the second half. That's the kind of game that separates these two from the rest of the pile. Yeah, I, I think, John, that's a good point, isn't it? They, they just seem to have the weapons one way or another yeah. to grab the goals but there's so much it seems to be so much belief from players like Henderson mm. uh, you know when when Mane scores the goal there's no great surprise on any of his teammates faces they mm. they obviously see him score goals like that week in week out day in day out mm. in training no great surprise there Let's talk a bit about uh, mentality because that was on the mind of somebody who tweeted uh, to us uh, over the course of the weekend. This was Mohamed Yaya saying, it doesn't matter if you support Liverpool or not. You just have to admire them, the way they never gave up, even one down in 88 minutes. That's what champions are made of. I believe they'll take City to the end again. Well, Mark, let's address the point before that. We've seen this before, haven't we? Um, maybe in the Fergie era. Do you think they get inside the head? You know, this one here, scaring the life out of opponents. Yes, it was Halloween and all that. But do you think Liverpool are in the op opponent's head? Are they thinking, yeah, I know we're winning here, but Liverpool are going to score, aren't they? 100%. I mean, I remember early 90s, you know, that era playing Arsenal, playing Manchester United. You knew that you had, it just had to be an almighty performance. You needed a lot of luck on your side. You needed them to have a bad day um, at the office. And even then, you still probably would go away without three points. So, yeah. There's no doubt before the game, leading up to it, you know you're playing one of those big guns that you're going to be right up against it. And what's interesting is it is mentality. Klopp was angry about their mental attitude. He thought they got it wrong. He said they needed to be warriors. They always need to be warriors. And if we take a look, John, at what they've done in recent games, Liverpool, they've, by and large, with the exception of, uh, I think, that one game there, the Genk one, they've always had a late goal that has counted for something, whether it's been to draw yeah. or to win. Yeah, where they just find that little bit extra. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit later on about where that extra comes from. It's mm. not quite where you think. It's not quite the engine room. Mm. Origi um, scoring in 90 plus four minutes. Absolutely incredible stuff. An early goal there from Salah in the 75th. Mm. Um, but it's coming down now those wide areas, John, constantly. Quality coming in late. Let's talk a bit about the mental side of things here in terms of the, the battle that lies ahead at Anfield this coming weekend because Pep Guardiola is already... Well, he's given the papers something that they just dream of. He's given them something to work with. Uh, they say fires opening salvo, mind games start before the Titanic clash. That's what's going to happen all week long. If we actually look at the quote, he was talking about Sadio Mane, wasn't he? Um, and, and what he said about him was, it's happened many times, what Liverpool have done in the last few years. It's because Mane is a special talent. Sometimes he's diving, sometimes he's this talent to score incredible goals in the last minute. He's a talent. Clever that, isn't it, uh, Mark, from, from Pep? You know, it's, it's either a backhanded compliment or a backhanded insult, or both, really, isn't it, at the same time? Listen, all the big name players, all of them do it. You know, you, you talk about Cristiano Ronaldo, you talk about Messi. They've all had a dive in, the, in their history. You know, I played against Ronaldo for Middlesbrough and he took the biggest dive in the world to win a penalty before the AR, of course. Um, they all do it. But they are top, top quality players. And, and hopefully with AR, it gets reduced. But not in the moment. <laughs> OK, let's um, just get on to Raymond Lowe, who's written in uh, on Facebook saying, City have just beaten Southampton and all that Pep wants to talk about is Mane's quote talent he must be having nightmares at the prospect of facing Liverpool's front three with the dodgy City defence next Sunday yeah everyone's talking about Sadio Mane right now for one reason or another this was uh, uh, Andy Dunn's column uh, in the Sunday Mirror this weekend Mane's a player to savour it's a shame he can't resist the pull of theatrics well, what's your take on on these exaggerated falls um, 
as a former professional, you do what you can to gain the advantage for your side. And look, this isn't amateur football. This isn't all about spirit of the game. This is elite level professional football and you do what you can. If look, if you can create, you can get into a position where you can get the defender to just be one, one step out of the, uh, out of the ordinary, mm. to just be a little bit late, I feel you've earned the right to go down. There's, uh, okay, that's one player that may be on the mind of Pep Guardiola. It's tempting to suggest, Mark, that maybe, maybe Fabinho would be another one. Now, this was a tweet that came in here from uh, Roy Allen saying a Liverpool team without Fabinho and including Henderson is significantly weakened. I, I think I see the point. Uh, we're we're going to have a little look at what Liverpool do and don't do and how they're effective or otherwise through midfield. What is clear is that he protected Fabinho, didn't he, to make sure he'd be available because he at the moment, Mark, looks like the one who could get around and negate City's formidable midfield. Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, a lot of games are won and lost in midfield. There's no, no doubt about it. I mean, what, what Liverpool's midfield do, though, I mean, they work incredibly hard. They break up play. They, 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 um, when they do break up play, they look then to pass the ball off, offload it. And the person that generally is in the right position or in a, in a free position are their wingbacks, their two fullbacks. And that's mm. where, obviously, all their service comes from. So even though they might not be the... the the, the, the creators of, of many, many opportunities for Liverpool, but they are the, the workroom. There's no doubt about it. And they are important. Now, I think it's become even more emphasised this year, hasn't it? Because if we take a little look, let, let's compare these two, John. You were studying these earlier on. So yeah. Fabinho up against Henderson, it's not much of a contest, is it, right now? No, it's not. I mean, look at the total passes for Fabinho. Perhaps mm. he's getting the ball in uh, slightly ineffectual areas and just maybe, you know, just shoveling mm. it out into wide areas a little bit more. Jordan Henderson may be going for that killer pass a little bit more in advanced areas, maybe. If we could just have a look, though, defensively, mm. this, is what, this is what shocked me. 75 recoveries yeah. is exceptional. And we're still quite early on in the mm. season. 13 uh, interceptions, Jordan Henderson, very, very similar. And, uh, you know, clearances are very close as well. Attacking. Now, you'd think maybe Jordan Henderson would, uh, mm. would pip Fabinho attacking-wise, but losses of possession, that's a whole heap. 135 is far too much, but this is the one that jumped mm. out at us. Mm. 12 key passes for Fabinho. 12 key passes, John. He's Incredible. on the ball. A lot. He goes and gets the ball. He breaks up play. He creates. So he is there all around midfielder. Mark, I just want to put this one up here. What's not coming from midfield, though, is really that killer pass. Because creatively, we know about Alexander-Arnold, who's the quarterback. We know that he basically prompts the team. Robertson as well plays his part from one side. And then the front three, well, they set each other up as much. And we saw that happen from Mane at the weekend to telling effect. So even more than ever, it's all about this front five, if you will, for Liverpool, isn't it? Of course, yeah, no, it has been for a long, long time. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we, we've, we've seen it before that, that uh, we've said it before lots of times that front three is, is so important. We've seen now uh, Alexander Arnold getting involved even more. We talk about Robinson, how vital that, that, that all those five players are to the way that Liverpool play and how attacking um, uh, or how, how effective they are going forward. And, and those two wingbacks in particular, the two fullbacks, play a massive role in that. All right, well, let's illustrate that, John. If we accept, then, that this is the way Liverpool play their football, if we accept that, really, it's all about, thank you, having the full-backs up here where, where he's going to quarterback and do everything, yeah. where he's going to get in the box, he's going to cross, and these three are going to be fluid, what does it leave for whichever three play here? Well... First off, when you're playing against, and Mark will tell you, whenever you're playing against a really strong side, you'll never hear your coach say, we've got to keep it tight in the wide areas. He'll always say, keep it super tight centrally, mm -hmm. okay? okay? And when you're playing, you've got to keep it strong in the, uh, on the spine. The problem is, Robertson and, and Trent Alexander-Arnold, as you quite rightly said, they're always free. So what you're going to have is Lalana, Henderson and Wijnaldum sacrifice themselves creatively because there's not a lot of space for them to get forward mm. because you've got the rotational fluid movement of those front three right there, John. Let's say, let, let's, let's just make a change. Let's sub Fabinho uh, in, if you can. Uh, sorry, let's just bring that back to the away side. Let's sub Fabinho into this team for Henderson right now, OK? okay. So let's, let's, let's get him into this game and have him in 
for Henderson. Now, it changes because you've just demonstrated that he gets around the park and does a lot, right? Yeah, it does. Uh, so you end up just having Fabinho, who likes to be in that central area right there. And he can get through a whole workload. He really can get through a whole workload. Now, he comes into his four later on in the game when they're playing against, let's say, a Villa. And Villa's getting tired after an hour. Mm -hmm. And they're sitting yeah. back. And they're trying to kill that space in behind. And there's nothing for uh, Firmino, for Salah or Mane to run into. Then it's this area. This area now becomes a lot more tasty for a midfielder to get forward, John. And then the last point would be... Klopp has been saying repeatedly recently, the one guy that I think needs to be doing this a little bit more is this guy, Oxlade Chamberlain. Let's say, for example, you have him in here. He brings the long-range shooting to play, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. And I've got to say, Wijnaldum sacrifices his skills because Wijnaldum can operate in this area really well, as he does for the Orangi national team jersey. Mm. Oxlade Chamberlain has been finding himself in, these, in this area right now, not linking play up with Salah, Firmino or Mane, mm. but just getting, picking off those little, uh, those little bits and striking it really well into the corners. All right, thank you very much, John. Just uh, time for a little bit more feedback before we wrap things up here. Uh, this is uh, from Mohamed Idris here. The Liverpool player's got mentality monster ready to give Manchester City a big fight when they come to Anfield this weekend. Pep will try to frustrate Klopp by using the same man-marking method as before. Mark, just quickly on this one, uh, are we likely to see a nil-nil? There's talk that David Silva, for instance, might struggle to make this game. Would he be a big miss? Even this far out, what do you expect from the first clash of these two this season? Uh, what do I expect? I don't expect a nil-nil. I expect both teams to really play their game, try and play their game. Liverpool want to stamp their authority. Manchester City know that losing the game, all of a sudden that gap becomes bigger again. They need to win against Liverpool, really, or at the very least not lose. Um, I, I don't think either team will go into the game just, just trying to get a, a, a draw or be happy with a draw. All right, thank you very much, Mark. We'll take a little bit of a breather right now. Keep the comments coming, and we're going to turn our attention to those just behind the top two right now. Most notably, first of all, Leicester City as the Foxes really show what they're about this weekend. Thanks so much for being with us once more tonight. More from Mark Schwartz and John Wilkinson very shortly. When we come back, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about Leicester City. We're going to talk about Chelsea. So far, so good. We're going to talk about Arsenal, Spurs, Manchester United. Maybe not so good. You've got opinions on those. I know you do. Keep them coming in and we'll get them up on screen soon. Welcome back. We showed you that uh, league table earlier on that had Leicester City by virtue of the goal scoring, which has been remarkable this season, uh, just getting ahead of Chelsea and uh, tucking in a couple of points behind Manchester City, all because of that run. Obviously, the 9-0 stands out there, but they backed up, didn't they? They, they didn't produce another 9-0. What they did instead, John, was maybe something just as impressive. They went to a team in form at, at a rocking, vibrant ground, and they produced a great performance. Oh, it was a great performance. Great team performance. Absolutely dominated. Uh, Soyuncu, Chu, what a revelation he's mm. been. He was a guy that, when he came into the Premier League, I wasn't sure about him. I thought he was a bit of a liability. But that goal from Vardy, mm. uh, it was straight off the training ground. It's pattern of play. Um, he was the one who started it off as well. It was my favourite goal of the weekend in any league, John. I thought it was uh, sublime. Great finish from him as well. Really tough finish. Uh, and he looks a happy man right now, doesn't he? Yeah, just talking about Brendan Rodgers, um, he, he's come out and, and you know, been talking about what he's talking to the players about, what, what he's getting in their minds or otherwise right now. And, and it was interesting, he's been talking about this, saying, I won't put my team in a top four trap. What this means from the Leicester Mercury newspaper is he's saying, I I'm not letting them talk about the top four. Mark, this is interesting because it's so early in the season just yet, but Leicester, in most people's eyes, are the real deal. They look as if they've got the squad. They certainly have the talent. So do they have to start addressing ambition now? Yeah, they're talking about what? Well, the ambition is first to get to 40 points to stay in the league. <laughs> <laughs> Which they did, obviously, a couple of 
because of the goal when I was there. Uh, no, yeah, listen, they're, 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 they're flying. They've done really well. They're, they're looking like a, a, at the very least, a top six team. That's for sure. Um, you know, yesterday's performance, like you're saying, really, really good, really professional. And I think inwardly, they are aiming for that top four. Outwardly, the, the messages will be all about concentration and let's just see where we go. But we are looking to finish very high in the table. Well, of course, uh, you're absolutely right because they kept talking about, Claudio kept talking about getting to 40 points, even in that Dilly Ding, Dilly Dong title winning season, didn't he? Imran Rafi, uh, Fariz, uh, John, agrees with you on Soyuncu, an old-fashioned centre-back, decent on the ball too, mixes it up with no-nonsense display, and you're right, you're pointing to that bargain million. these days. 19 million. Well, and who did he replace? Well, exactly. Exactly. No, 60-odd I mean. million worth of Harry Maguire. But that was, that's what's key. That's what, he is decent on the ball. Mm. He is decent on the ball, and he's only decent on the ball because he knows his place. He knows just to, just to shunt it about five yards. Thank you very much to someone a little bit more talented. Just a quick last word there on Leicester, by the way. They have got more points than they did at the same stage of their title-winning season. They've got Chelsea uh, just behind them uh, as well. And Frank Lampard, this is a nice line from Adrian uh, Kajumba in the mail today, saying Lampard's pulling off the impossible. He's making Chelsea popular. OK, don't get too angry about it. But you know what? He's, he's, the neutrals are being won over by this Chelsea side. Um, and the thing about this one, Mark, is it's because it's the nature of what they're doing. When you keep going away from home and looking as good, I mean, it said 2-1. And in the end, the irony is that Kepa... Uh, earned them those points by saving from Ben Foster. But really, this is a game they could again have scored three, four goals in away from home. Yeah, they could have. And, and uh, I had them down to score three or four. <laughs> uh, but yeah, now listen, they've been brilliant. They're, they're, they're exciting to watch. Everything about them at the moment has is, is, is been fantastic. And I, I think it's right. You know, I, I think from, from the neutrals perspective, people are really starting to admire what Chelsea are doing and, 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 and appreciating and enjoy watching them play. And when we dissect what it is that Frank Lampard is doing right, we've been talking so much about making the youngsters play with bravery, right? We've spoken about Mount, we've spoken about uh, Hudson Odoi, spoken about Tammy Abram all season long. But there's another player, somebody who was there, who, who seems to be transformed under yeah. Frank, right? Yeah, yeah, new lease of life, perhaps, and we'll find out a little bit more about him. Jorginho, I think, uh, has been great. I think he's been great under Frank Lampard. I mean, that's his I touch map against Watford. I mean, get through a whole heap of work, he really mm. does. And there's a lot to be said for, as a central midfielder, playing for a midfielder. And um, he just seems a lot clearer now in what his job is, which is to be involved, to mm. constantly be involved. There, er, there's no area off limits for him. And uh, I think he just plays a lot freer. In contrast to Sarri, John, that action area further up the pitch, I mean, that leaps out at you, doesn't it? Yeah, look... I think we can overcomplicate football. I think, well, we do overcomplicate mm. football. You know, sometimes we have to, but it's a simple game. And a midfielder, it's okay as mm. a midfielder to be called a midfielder, not a defensive midfielder, not an attacking midfielder. Yeah, yeah. As a midfielder, you should be able to tackle, pass, and go on and score goals. And, 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 and he's confident, isn't he? And he's comfortable doing everything. Yeah, OK, quick comment from uh, Prem Kumar, who's uh, been in touch with us as ever. Um, the young boys seem to be gelling together, and the senior boys are also mm. playing their part in a relatively young squad. Yeah, that's the blend. Good William point, especially. Prem. William's being fantastic. Very good well. point. And, of course, that could have gone one or two of other ways, couldn't it? Turn our attention to another of last night's games right now. This is Tottenham Hotspur, for whom things just aren't clicking right now. Uh, a 1-1. Um, it's only two wins away from home in 19 matches now in all competitions for Pochettino's side. They just have nothing on the road. But this was a game, of course, that hinged so much on that horrendous injury for Andrew Gomez. Um, uh, Son there, his reaction to what happened, and of course the red card, and then the goal that they conceded coming in after that one. Uh, Mark, talk us through this one. That one incident defined this game, didn't it, in so many ways? Yeah, it did. Um, when anything happens of, of that sort of severity, of course, it, it's, it's the focal point, the talking point. Um, and, you know, it's a horrendous injury. Um, and you just hope he recovers as best as he can and as soon as he can. It's, it's going to be a long road for him. But, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that can happen in football. I feel sorry. I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for Son because, you know, it's, it's such a, a, a challenge that there was nothing in it. You know, it was a slightly lazy, probably, you know, tired challenge late in the game, but mm. nothing that really would have led to, to an injury of such a severity. Well, the interesting thing about this is, is it raises the question of the, the yellow that became a red. I mean, it was quite clear, as we saw from those stills there, that, that Atkinson had the yellow card ready. Uh, and this now leads to this question about 
do Spurs then say, do we go and, and rescind this one? Now, this is a tweet from Paul Clues saying, if anyone believes Son meant to cause serious injury, then I'm afraid you've lost the plot. And that's what Mark was saying. I hope Spurs appeal, though they might not politically, but the FA, he says, should rescind the red immediately. The guy did nothing wrong. John, where are you on this one? Do you think Spurs might be a little awkward about this? Saying, would it be improper of them to, to seek to, 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 to get that rescinded? I think they might be. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. They should be, uh, they should be thinking about their play. They should be thinking about Son because, mm. you know, his, he, he's, he hasn't, he's not a malicious character by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. He's quite affable. Um, he's well-liked within the football fraternity, and it's a small fraternity. Um, and you do feel sorry for him because he was absolutely distraught. Lucas Moura as well. Um, I, th I hope they do appeal because it's ridiculous. No way is that a red card. And the referee knew it wasn't as well. He mm. just got that little voice above that yeah. weren't anywhere near the pitch and had no feel for the game at that time. OK, OK. Uh, it, 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 let's not take away as well from what happened. Uh, Victor Sims written uh, in on this one as well. Um, that Ericsson's gone off the boil, not offering anything to the team. Can you really bench him now that Hongmin's son is suspended? There is that. Yeah, there's so much about Spurs that's wrong right now. And how are they going to fix this? If we take a little look at, you know, what they've got to come. OK, so they miss Son. I mean, they've got Sheffield United. No easy task, it must be said. Um, West Ham, Bournemouth, that Manchester United game, Burnley, Wolves. But you could look at any game now, John, and you could say, well, is the manager going to get it right? Is he, should he have played Ericsson for as long as he did in this game? Is he making the right decisions? It's, you look at two games in particular. A London derby on the 23rd of November mm. or at Old Trafford on the 4th of December. Either of those two games can be a big pickup, a big shot in the arm for, for Tottenham Hotspur. And I can't see... Look, I think every game for Spurs now is tough because they're not together. As a team, as a unit, they're not together. And we spoke about it last mm. week. Pochettino has a certain aura of apathy around him. A kind of lethargy if you will like he's like he's opted out slightly apathy lethargy you want apathy and leth lethargy let's go across north london to <laughs> arsenal shall we right now because fans are going absolutely nuts right now uh, about unai emery um this headline here uh unai's in disarray third skipper in a week yeah obama young he spoke about that didn't he um and again arsenal let it slip this from uh, uh the mail here emery struggles to stay afloat confused tactics lack of ideas arsenal lose battles to save job what's going on here mark i mean how, how critical are you of unai emery do you think he's struggling tactically uh to be consistent uh yes <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, he's actually got to a point where he almost has run out of ideas. He doesn't really know what to do with the, with the group of players that he has. And I'm going to say it, I've already seen it. Uh, the signs are out. Wenger in. You know, who would have thought? Um, Good Lord. Be careful what you wish for. And, and you know what? I think he should definitely be doing a lot better with the players that he has. Um, so it's, it, I can understand the, fa the fans' frustration. The only thing about this one, though, is that, John, they are in fifth. Um, they're, they're some way ahead of Manchester United, a long way ahead of Tottenham Hotspur. So it's, it's, not, it's not as if they're plummeting. It's not as if they're, no. they're down in the relegation places. Do the fans, are the fans right to be disaggrieved with him? Yes, especially when you hear Mark <laughs> Schwartz <laughs> saying that uh, <laughs> their coaches have ran out of ideas, and that is scary. When a coach really doesn't... He's run out of answers with the players that he's got. Mm. Now, one, one of the plus sides plus size is Arsenal have something that a lot of other bigger mm. clubs don't have, which is a ruthless strike force. The problem yeah. is Aubameyang and Lacazette, they're not quite getting the service regularly enough and they have to score with that one chance that they get in a game. And that's a lot of pressure. They've got to keep hold of them as well. And that strike force is mm. getting a little bit older, the wrong side of 30. He's on borrowed time. I tell you who'd kill for a ruthless strike force, and that's Manchester United uh, manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer right now, because boy, oh boy, oh boy. This is Jamie Redknapp's column in the uh, mail today, Solskjaer's reality check. The problem with this result, getting beaten on a horrible, wet, windy day at Bournemouth, Mark, was you could see it coming. Now, they've come off the back of a, of a very solid week for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Significant away results, a, a, a strong result um, against Liverpool not that long ago. But you could almost see this coming, couldn't you? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, the thing is, we, we're talking about a, a decent amount of results. Well, they're four games undefeated. Is that a decent uh, amount of results for Manchester United? I don't think so. And I think 
Jerry Redknapp must be watching our show because he knows that I said about Lukaku and should have gone mm. to Pogba and kept Lukaku. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> Let's have a little look at the um, attacking options as they are, and it's pretty bare bones here. Um, it gets worse as it gets towards you, I'm afraid, John. Um, Rashford, obviously, who seems to have injured his knee doing a knee slide, um, leading the way with five goals, one assist, 1.4 key passes per game. But then the drop-off is dramatic under that. <laughs> There's not a whole lot there. I is there the talent in this group, if the confidence were there, to, to do better, to put up better numbers? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do think that uh, James in particular, the area that he operates, mm. more key passes from him, please. I mean, he's got the ability. Um, you didn't do your knee from a knee slide, did you, John? <laughs> no. I just looked at your no, knee straight No, I never, score, I never score goals, John. <laughs> um, there is. I mean, Greenwood, I mean, he, didn't, he hasn't played nearly enough, but um, I'd like to see a little bit more of one matter. But that is, that's, that's a good thing. Key passes for Manchester United are absolutely, mm. uh, that's what we need to be looking at in that final third. There's nowhere near enough creativity. They look decent on the counter-attack, but they always seem like they're countering at the moment. Mark, I know you're leaving us a little bit early today, um, but just give us your last take on this one here. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer it seems to have the backing. The fans are furious. Uh, we're going to contrast that with the Niko Kovac by Munich situation very shortly. Different position that that club is in right now. Are we just going to expect this from Solskjaer's United? Are they going to have a few decent games and then a few howlers? Uh, yeah, I think there's going to be more howlers than decent games, to be perfectly honest with you. And I, I'll go back to what I said as well. I, I'd be surprised if he lasted to Christmas. Um, I did get ridiculed by a lot of Manchester United fans for saying it. Um, but I still think, I, I, I just can't see them going beyond. If they, if they keep him to Christmas, they're going to have another very, very mid-season, at best, uh, end of season. Oh dear. Okay, let's just go back to Arsenal quickly because you guys are firing uh, feedback at us all the time. Uh, Amaobi, Umay Emery has spent more than a year with Arsenal. No tactics. No one understands him. His substitution catastrophic. Lost many games from winning positions. Yeah, that's pretty damning. Uh, America Madiba, I asked this question: What has Unai brought to Arsenal that is better than what Wenger did? Uh, it's funny. This revisionism thing does tend to rear its head, doesn't it? I mean, Wenger had got to the end of the road by the looks of things, but it's a valid point. Are they any better? Well, you you always knew what. Wenger was wanted to do in a in a football match, yeah. you know, and yeah. he didn't taper his tactics to anybody, which was frustrating for the yeah. Arsenal faithful. Uh, contrastly, Unai Emery yeah. doesn't seem like he knows what he wants to do. Oh dear me, uh, Mark. I think that's just about it for you. Thanks very much for your contribution as ever. Have yourself a great week, and we'll catch up with you next week. Cheers, guys. All right, that's Mark Schwartz for signing off, but uh, we've got a lot to talk about, most notably the sacking by Bayern Munich of uh, Nico Kovac. We'll have Raphael Honigstein joining us to discuss what next for Bayern Munich. John's going to take a close look at what went wrong, in particular this weekend with his downfall against his former club. And that is that. It comes to an end for Niko Kovac in dramatic circumstances. We'll come to that in just a moment with a special guest. But what a weekend in the Bundesliga, John. I know that you covered it all weekend long. Remarkable. An 8 nil for Leipzig. If I'm not mistaken, they were seven up in 50 minutes in that one. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Timo Werner getting a hat-trick. Mm. He's back amongst the goals. Looks as good as ever. Um, Dusseldorf getting a win on Sunday against Cologne. That was a massive game and a poor result away for Cologne. Dortmund 3-0 against Wolfsburg. Mm. Wolfsburg has been going great guns, but that was a dominant performance. Jaden Sancho starting on the bench. But yeah. Your eye is I mean, drawn to Frankfurt 5 by and 1, right? Five, well, I mean, I called it. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I mean, Boateng getting sent off and 5-1. Um, uh, and it leaves Bayern Munich in fourth place, four off the, the top, the pace set by Mönchengladbach. Yeah, and it's incredibly competitive. I would say all the way down to ninth, Leverkusen a little bit off the pace. Kai Havertz not really doing the business. Mm. But um, look at that. I mean, even Freiburg right up there in European places. The fans wouldn't expect it. 
probably don't care about it too much. And this league table, John, is the product of this uncertainty. We've seen chopping and changing, but you can't do it if you're Bayern Munich. You can't do it if you're the coach there. Standards are different. This one here, of course, this one. Um, so after the 5-1 debacle, they fire Kovac. And of course, Hansi Flick, uh, uh, the assistant, takes temporary charge here. OK, so let's get to uh, our German football expert, Rafa Honigstein, who very kindly joins us to give us some reaction to this one. Rafa, thanks very much for, for, for coming on the show. Uh, first things first, did you see this coming? Yes, it's been coming for a long time. I think Bayern were looking for the right moment. They were differing a little bit. And when Kovac himself said, you know what, I've got a feeling that my time is up, he basically offers, offered his resignation on Sunday. Mm. They were very quick to accept. So uh, it wasn't necessarily a case that they were dying to get rid of him, but the relationship with him and the players had been broken for such a long time mm. that it was just a question of the right timing. And he effectively made up their mind for him. OK, let's just get a quick bit of feedback away from uh, Prem Kumar, who um, says, I believe the Bayern hierarchy already didn't want him since the end of last season, just waiting for a solid reason to get rid of him. And Bayern getting thumped by Frankfurt is a solid enough reason. OK, so that bears out everything that Rafa's been telling us. Yeah, I think we suspected this. Why? Why, why didn't it work? Why couldn't he work? This was an interesting one from the Tagesspiel, in which they said uh, an unsophisticated fighter. So, John, this is getting into his tactical or lack of tactical now, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, he would just pick a team and allow them to just go on and do what they do. And there's a certain skill to that, a certain mm. restraint to that. Um, but when you're playing against a decent Frankfurt side who are putting you to the sword and you affect the game not one iota, mm. the fans were, were really, really cross. He did nothing in the game, tactically or otherwise, did nothing. There was, there was no grizzling even on the sideline. Mm. Um, you know, we talk about Pochettino's yeah. apathy. There was a certain apathy and discontent from him on the and side. And those, those last two goals when they went in, that was not Bayern. They, they, no. That doesn't happen to Bayern Munich there. Just a uh, Fox Sports commentator, Keith Costigan, uh, tweeted and made a point that I wanted to pick up on here. Kovac never had the full support of the people that matter at Bayern, he wrote. Won the double last season, but you always felt he wasn't, quote, their man. I think he'll be successful where he ends up, but what next for Bayern? OK, Rafa, I'll throw that at you. Um, did, did you. Was that it? Was he not their man, or not all of their man, or maybe the new man's man? <laughs> well, Uli Hoeneß, the president who is about to depart, was, of course, this big becker, and it mm. is right that Karl-Heinz Rummingberg was never that convinced. But that in itself was not enough for Kovac to fail, because they, they, they gave him a second season, thinking that maybe things will improve with a new team, maybe he will grow into the role, but of course, uh, the reverse has happened. They have actually regressed and things had uh, threatened to fall apart completely. And ultimately, you know, a coach at Bayern Munich has one job. He has to win. And the best mm. way of winning is to keep the players happy and to mm. give them help when it comes to performing well. Unfortunately for Kovac, he wasn't able to do either of those things. It's harsh. I mean, we were just talking, weren't we, about Manchester United and their different ambitions these days. If you take a little look at Kovac, I mean, see, this is a top-level European club, right, John? And you've got a, a best part of a 70% win rate. You've got a Bundesliga title. You've got three trophies in that time there. Yeah. Not good enough. Not good enough. Not good enough. Bayern have to play a certain style. You know, and they've been edging matches 2-1. Bayern this season, I, I, I've never had a quite clear sense of outside of Lewandowski scoring a goal, which is a given every single game, even when you lose 5-1 quite what he was getting at. What, what, what is Kovac tactically for you? Why does Keith think he will be a success somewhere else? I think he might be a success where a team um, is not desperate to have the ball as much. I think his football, mm. if you think back to the Frankfurt days, was based on a very muscular approach, which was counter-attacking football, defensively very solid, a lot of energy, a lot of commitment, a lot of togetherness. These things are a good foundation. But then you need to add those levels. And don't forget, this bulk of the Bayern Munich team were all exposed to Pep Guardiola's football. Uh, those who weren't had exposure of Nagelsmann, of Simeone, of Klopp. So they were used to a manager really going into the weeds, into the details of what they're supposed to do once they have the ball. And they felt left alone by Kovac. And when then Kovac turned on them and said, you know what, you're making mistakes, you're not doing what I think, that's when you really lost them. Because you can only do that if you're convinced as a manager that you really are able to help and influence your team positively and he wasn't able to do that. 
Well, um, this is certainly one of my favourite Twitter handles recently. This is at uh, Quabena Babyface, very nice indeed. Wrote in saying Niko Kovac was in charge for 490 days, listed all those stats that we gave, just eight defeats along the way. Um, Tender is away from an exceptional tweet. But then, of course, down here, Oli, United manager, 29 games, 8 wins, 9 draws, 12 losses. As we said, different standards. The clubs are in different places right now, it has to be said. But turning this back to a rather more serious note, uh, uh, the downfall, uh, the Untergang here. Um, OK, what on earth happened here? It's notable, isn't it, that uh, uh, Mr Boateng is the one, John, that is singled out in this, because that really was the trigger for this, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And, um, you know, defensively, Bayern have been poor for a while. Uh, by their standards, they've been poor for a while. And uh, Mark Schwarzer and I, we were talking. But that little shot of Kovac there, that could have been at any minute, any stage of the game. Mm. He just stood in his technical area. There was no emotion. Well, he knew, he there was knew the nothing, game was up. No effect. No yeah. effect. Knew the game was he up. Knew the no game. effect that, whatsoever. And, and that's a worry, isn't it? That really is a worry. I mean, Gene Arag's just written in here making a good point. They should have done it after Der Klassiker. That's a good one, isn't it, Rafa, really? Mm. Because, you know, defeats, heavy defeats are damaging. Very damaging, as I said, those, those last couple of goals that went in, Bayern's heads were way down. You don't really want that ahead of the Classic, do you? No, you're right. Uh, the problem for Bayern was that Kovac often won those key games, and it could have happened again. If he'd won the next Classic, then I think it would have been more difficult for them to fire him, even though deep down they knew he was not really the right man to take this Bayern team forward. So I think to make that clean cut now and then to give themselves a chance to, over the international break, uh, really dig down into uh, the options available is, is good timing, even though it's probably not what they wanted initially. Um, it kind of makes sense in the grand scheme of things, and hopefully they'll have better options, because let's not forget, he only got the job because the, the real options, the real contenders, Jupp Heynckes for Uli Hoeneß and Thomas Tuchel for uh, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, were not available at the time. Mm. OK, let's just move it on now to that conversation about who will be. This was Imran Fariz writing in just now on Facebook. Kovac was walking a tightrope at Bayern. Uh, board uh, acted as the players seem to have lost their faith in him. Rangnick and Ten Hag in the interim with Poch or Nagelsmann, you say, for the long haul. OK, so let's move this on. We go to the bookmakers' favourites, and yes, I'll be surprised that Jose Mourinho is there at one. We've got uh, Flick, who's the interim right now, Ten Hag, Allegri, Tuchel, and uh, Adi Hutta um, um, there, listed uh, of, of his former club. Now, um, uh, Rafa, I don't want to go down the Mourinho route again, because the viewers know I get upset about media manipulation, fanboys, all the nonsense that goes with Mourinho. You have to look at the fit for the club, don't you? So... Does Mourinho, would Mourinho fit Bayern Munich? Not really, no. I mean, Mourinho has problems working within a very defined structure. Things get very political when he doesn't get his way, doesn't get the players he wants, doesn't get the investment he wants, doesn't get the backing he wants. He comes with too much baggage for Bayern's liking. They distrust um, big egos anyway. They want more pliable managers if possible. Um, so it doesn't really tick enough boxes for Bayern. So I think uh, it's much more likely they'll go for someone who they feel is a bit of a safer option. And uh, the two names that have been mentioned to me is Ralf Rangnick, who's, of course, available. He's out of a coaching job at the moment, and I think would love to go back into coaching. Mm. And Ten Hag, Ten Hag, who has done wonders for Ajax, and, of course, has a Bayern background, having worked as a youth coach. And he'd be the first guy to understand that you'd have to sort of figure into this complex uh, structure somehow. Um, so those two are the ones that I think are at the moment the most likely candidates to succeed Hansi Flick in the full-time role. I noticed you nodding agreement there, John. Mm. Are you going down that route as well? Yeah, definitely. Eric Ten Hag, I think he's the standout candidate mm. for me. Um, speaking to um, a Dutch friend of mine, whose grandfather used to be the president of Ajax. He actually texted me this morning and said that he thinks Ten Hag's going to go and Hakim's going to follow him as well. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I'm with that. OK, all right, thank you very much. Hey, Rafa, thanks so much. Appreciate you popping up and giving us those insights into a huge story in European football. <laughs> Keep well, my friend. We'll see you soon. Thank you. That's Rafael Honigstein signing off, but we'll stay on the continent as we turn our attention to Spain and beyond, because as far as La Liga was concerned, it was the League of Punctures, as in things going very flat for the big clubs. That's next.
Boy, it's been a busy old show, and we're going to focus on uh, some real disappointments. Uh, Atletico, well, at least they didn't lose, but the Giants lost in La Liga, and it was good news for Real Sociedad. What did you make of what's been happening there? We'll also pay a little bit of attention to what happened in Serie A as well. So fire off a few comments. As you can see, we love to get your thoughts away. Welcome back. Let's just quickly look at Serie A and what happened this weekend. I think the most entertaining game I saw was Roma against Napoli. The woodwork was struck multiple times. We'll have a look at that in just a moment here. As far as the big two at the top of the table are concerned, uh, Lukaku at it once again as Inter had to come back against Bologna to win 2-1 away. A tight one also in the Turin derby, but in the end it was De Ligt who came up with the winner there for Juventus. Let's have a look at the headlines and there it is. Uh, uh, De Ligt does it all, including what might have been a handball mm -hmm. at one stage in that game that went unpunished. Uh, as far as Lukaku is concerned, whoa, would you take a little look, that ferocious hit. What was interesting about this one is they're saying that because his numbers are up there ahead of, uh, or up there with Ronaldo, the original Ronaldo, the phenomenon, they're saying he's, a, he's like a totem-like figure he's like a statesman like figure a figurehead for them and as a result Inter are all doing a lot better I'm interested in Roma we talk about Juventus and Inter all the time here this was a big big game this one for Roma and there's a freshness about them at times typified by their first goal scorer yeah yeah I mean look going to Stadio Olimpico is very very tough for anybody in Napoli once they went a goal down they started to dominate um, they have um, Milik, so they were trying to pump the ball nice and long, be very, very aggressive. But Roma just didn't back down at all. Um, some really nice football. Um, Got to say, I thought uh, uh, Zaniolo, the young lad, was really, really good. This was a handball. They, they, had a, they had a penalty that was missed as well. Have a look at that. Good finish there. It was, uh, it was a handball that um, Callahan mm. handled, and the VAR came in brilliantly on that because no one saw it in the stadium, John. So Kolarov misses his, but they get the other one, so that's what matters there. Um, OK, some more feedback coming in uh, all the time here. This is uh, Victor Sim uh, and probably Ernesto Valverde will be joining Nico Kovac <laughs> soon out of a job. Another loss away at home from Barcelona. Atletico cannot gain advantage following two successive draws in as many matches. Yeah, well, let's uh, do what Victor did, and let's uh, segue across to La Liga right now and talk about that because uh, yeah it, it was a defeat at the hands of Levante here Messi scores but then again Lewandowski scores and they lose heavily um, for Barcelona it's not clicking not, no not it's clicking. not clicking it's not clicking um, we could say it's not clicking up top for them it will always click up top for them he'll find a way yeah. this man will find a way um, midfield wise Arturo Vidal just starts a little bit too high I think in, in that central midfield area defensively mm. I just don't think they're sharp enough they need, to, they need to have a bit of a turnover of players, John Barcelona. They look a little bit stale. Um, yeah, it's not quite right. OK. Uh, meanwhile, uh, with Real Madrid, let's have a little look at uh, uh, Imran uh, Fariz, who's written it again. Both Barca and Real having mixed season. Yeah, lack of world-class coach seems to be hurting them. Can't be a better chance for Simeone to lead Atletico to a title. Well, the interesting thing about that is, is, as we just said in that other one from Victor, you know, they're, they're drawing yeah, as well. Failed so to take, someone's failed going to take advantage, haven't great they? Great opportunity, and they failed to take it, and that seems to be the way it goes week after week at the moment. One of the big boys slip, slips up, and the mm. other two just draw. So, um, yeah, missed but opportunity for both the Madrid sides. Uh, well, the only <clears throat> club that took advantage was Real Sociedad, because whilst we're looking at what happened to Real Madrid here, what we should point out is that they were the team that had an opportunity because this has been a fun season. Yeah. I mean, I know we're sitting here going on about Barca and, and, and Real being flat, but when you look at no points separating the top three, right? One point then separating the top five, and actually five points separating, oh, I don't know, I think it goes down to about 13. Mm. This is sensational entertainment. It is isn't great. It? It's difficult to pick the bones out of it, you know, and I urge any of the La Liga fans out there to just go and check on your favourite side and go and have a look at the fixtures coming up, mm. right? 
go and have a look at them. Um, all the way down to Osasuna, all the way down to Osasuna, I really do believe you're in, they're not for a title chase, but for Champions League places, European places, John. Great fun. All right, John, thanks very much. All right, still plenty more to come on the show. I hope you're enjoying it. Thanks for all the feedback so far. Stick around, more next. Now for something a little bit different. Over there you can see live shots coming in from the Kuala Lumpur Football Stadium which is where we're about to see the first major uh, Asian Continental Cup um, fought for as we've got the AFC Cup final about to get underway. So it's Al ahead of uh, Lebanon up against uh, April 25th of um, uh, North Korea and um, that's coming up live on this channel as soon as we go off air. So a bit of live stuff to talk about there. John, let's take a little look at what we've got here. We know that we're going to see a first-time winner. These two sides yet to win this competition and as far as their stats this season are concerned, well, uh, the wins, as you can see, all the way there for Al Ahed. No losses. They're a tough nut to crack. Goals conceded 0.3 per game. Yeah. Now, that is up against a team that is second best when it comes to goals per game for, i.e. 2.4, which is very healthy from the Koreans. Very, very healthy. And it's uh, Kim Sun Young who's the one who's getting uh, all the goals for them. I think he scored nine, which is one less than uh, Marignon for Ceres Negros. And, um, you know, both these sides, as you said, first timers, but they've been deep in this competition. The last couple of, couple of uh, editions, um, it's just been dominated by Air Force Cup, uh, Club over the last few, few seasons. So um, these guys are ready. These guys are ready, especially April 25th, because a couple of seasons ago, they were raw, they were wet behind the ears. They had some young players now a little bit more experience. It's all set up nicely, I feel, for April 25th to have a good tilt at this. Yeah, it's been a couple of near misses for these sides, hasn't it? Whether it's been getting to the interzonal finals or, or the one leg before that, and now they have a chance to go all the way. Let's talk a little bit more tactically about what we might expect from this one. It's a tricky one to call, as I said, because you've got a free scoring team up against a strong defensive side here. And it's a defensive side in Alahed who have an absolute monster of a goalkeeper in their ranks. They are impressive when it comes to keeping teams out. Yeah, look, you need a goalkeeper who's an absolute beast. And, and um, uh, Mehdi Khalil is just that. Yeah, he certainly is. He certainly is, especially when you've got a uh, free scoring side up against you, um, like those North Koreans, because it, um, they score a lot of their goals late on. Physical specimens, they run uh, all day long. Um, and. Um, Song Young Min, uh, he's, Song is uh, one of the type of players that starts on the right-hand side and becomes a central figure, a central striker late on in the, late on in the game. Um, scores a lot of goals in the air, of course, so you need a dominating back line. Mm. And um, Al Ahed, they have that. OK, I'm just watching the uh, Korean side arrive here. It's a fascination. Now, remember, of course, this was a game that was scheduled for, uh, to be played in Pyongyang, uh, then moved to Shanghai. Now it's in Kuala Lumpur. There's a degree of mystery, a degree of uncertainty about this one. We're trying to figure out what happens tactically when a side like this one, which is demonstrated as it's grown in this competition, as you've rightly said, that it will find a way to goal against a team that certainly demonstrated against Al Jazeera last time that they're resolute, that they won't give much, and if they can nick a goal, they will. So 
Are you leaning towards the Koreans here? Was that what you were saying earlier? I am. I am leaning towards. I've seen the Koreans play the last couple of times in, in this competition. I've, I've seen them live down at Jalan Basar Stadium against Home United a couple of, a couple of seasons ago. And they play with great structure. Mm. And it's the same group of players. Same group of players. They're experienced now on the continent. Experienced enough. Um, Al Ahed a lot more rugged. A lot more rugged. A lot more free-flowing. Um, but I just think, I just think April 25th. Just thinking it's about a way time. to go, as you say that, you were talking about Kim Yusong earlier on, and, and, and what you do notice when you look at them is they've, they've got a couple of players in the wide areas, particularly down the left-hand side, who will get to the byline, who do look to put crosses in, and when they do so, there's a player who is really formidable when he gets it on his head. Yeah, you've also got uh, some just behind him on the back post there, and it's those two that end up in the, in the box. As this ball's just stood up there, you've got another, mm. there he is, the same two players always attacking that ball. Sometimes they make the same run. Um, but look, he's still a very young man as well. Scores all types of goals, but it is mainly those bread and butter goals inside the six-yard box with his head. But look, on that left peg, he's capable of that as well. So if you back off too much, mm. that's what you get. Should they win it, though, it would certainly go against the trend in terms of the way this competition has gone. Now, remember, this competition was reversioned uh, into all sorts of different zonal um, uh, brackets and sub-brackets, but the West has been dominant um, by zone in this competition. Uh, the central winners were Esther Glau uh, from the east, of course, famously, not too far away from you and I, John, uh, the Malaysian Giants JDT uh, in this competition. They've now graduated to uh, AFC Champions League football. But unsurprisingly, the West have been dominant, right? Yeah, it was. I mean, I think it was when JDT won in the final against Altin Asir. So, of course, it's the West Asians all the time mm. getting deep in this competition. So it would go heavily against the grain. And we can't, we can't underplay what a big deal it would be yep. for April 25th to go on and lift this. It'll be huge. It'll absolutely. be absolutely massive. And, um, you know, I'm hoping, for, I'm hoping for a little edge to this game. I fully expect an edge to this game. And if you do like an edge with your football, tune into this one. Uh, exactly. It's coming up, as I said earlier on, in just a few minutes' time, right here on Fox Sports, as our coverage of Asia's uh, Cup competitions. Uh, kicks off with that one. Right, okay, that's just about it from me and John. Enjoy the live football that's on its way. Hope you've enjoyed everything that's come along, and thanks for all your comments. See you Wednesday.